session we looked at Nehemiah chapter 3, at the rebuilding of the gates of Jerusalem. And now we want to look at chapters 4 and 6 that show us the opposition against the rebuilding of the walls of the gates of Nehemiah restoring the people of God in Judah to have a strong city, a strong capital. There was opposition against them. Please raise your hand if you do not have a copy of the notes. Okay. Keep your hands lifted high, okay? Then somebody will find you. In our notes we have, as Nehemiah and the Jews were rebuilding Jerusalem and the walls of Jerusalem, their enemies tried in many different ways to defeat them. And as God starts to use us in rebuilding our lives, our families, our churches, we will face many similar attacks. They wrestled with flesh and blood as the natural Old Testament people of God. We will wrestle against spiritual forces, but there are still the same parallels. There are still similarities behind the natural attacks they faced and the spiritual attacks we will face as we are spiritually rebuilding the people of God, the families and the churches. And so let's look at some of the opposition Nehemiah faced and see how this applies in our lives in chapters 4 and chapter 6. Let's start out by reading the first three verses of Nehemiah 4. But it so happened when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What are these people Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete in a day, will they re revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now that Tobiah and the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Okay, they were mocking the rebuilding of the Jews. Even if a little fox, like the size of a small dog, went on top of the wall, it would just crumble and tumble because they would uh, gr build such a weak, uh, ineffective wall out of the rubble, out of the broken stones. And so, at first, Sanballat, the governor of Samaria to the north, and Tobiah, the leader of the Ammonites over on the east, they stood before the army of Samaria, that's the northern province above Judah, and they mocked the ability of the Jews to rebuild. The governor mocked it to his army, now, the Jews did not have an army. They were both provinces of the Persian Empire, but the Jews had been a defeated people, pushed down, oppressed, and controlled by the provinces around. They weren't allowed by the other uh, surrounding areas to have any army, any defenses of their own. They were uh, controlled and oppressed by their neighbors. And so before his strong, mighty army, he was laughing at what the Jews were trying to do. How can they become strong? How can they rebuild a fortified city? No, we are the strong ones. They will never be able. But they also said that message before the army of Samaria so that all the Samaritans would go forth boastful and would repeat back to Nehemiah and the workers how feeble they were and how foolish it was for them to try to rebuild. So in verse 4, Nehemiah said in a prayer to God, Hear, O God, we are despised. The Jews heard the reproaches against them, how they were being mocked and despised, that they could never accomplish anything of significance. And we will face people that will mock us, that will try to discourage us. If you have a vision in God, or if you feel a calling in God and you tell it to people, a lot of times the people will laugh at you and say, ha, you want to be an international missionary? 
Oh, that's a joke. You could never do that. And there will be people that will mock and despise even what God speaks and what God wants to do in our lives. We know that when Moses sent the 12 spies up into Canaan land, 10 of the, them came back with a negative report. They, they all saw the same thing. They saw it was a fruitful land. It was a good, uh, plentiful land. But 10 of them brought back a report of fear and of unbelief. Well, the walls are so high, we could never conquer them. They've got giants, and we just look like grasshoppers. And It's impossible. And statistically, there's usually about 10 unbelievers among God's people for every two believers, okay? <laughs> for people that will believe God and go forward, there's always more people that will say, but we don't have any money. And we've never done that before. And, you know, that's not the way we do things. And, and, and people will just so often be discouragers. Before my family left to come to the Philippines 31 years ago, we had relatives discourage us and tell us, you know, our children will die of tropical diseases and grow up uneducated and tell us all these dangers. When my father, my natural father, came to the Philippines, uh, he uh, got our, at that time, our five-year-old daughter Esther off to the side. Uh, they were alone once. And, but... Linda was listening in the kitchen, washing the dishes, and she heard my father say to our five-year-old, Esther, you don't want to live in the Philippines. Oh, there's so many dangers here. There's robbers, and there's kidnappers, and, and there's so many dangerous things. Tell your parents that you should move back to America. Okay, so even, even the five-year-olds get attacked, okay? <laughs> And we have to be strong in God against the unbelievers, against, and they can be believers, Christians, but unbelievers not believing the great promises God has to us. And my wife was encouraged on that occasion when our five-year-old daughter said, Grandpa, I'm just a little girl. I don't know a lot of those things, robbers, kidnappers. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know a lot of those things, but I know one thing. I know God, and I know God brought us to the Philippines, and God will keep us safe. <laughs> and my wife heard, hmm, you know, you know God? <laughs> and that's what we need. Those that know their God will do exploits. Amen? Amen. Will rise up in God and do the unusual and won't listen to the discouragers around. 26 years ago, my family was praying about moving from Palawan to the Philippines to start a new ministry we thought we'd call Zion Ministries. Well, before we got the confirmation from Pastor Bailey that he felt it was God, first the, uh, the foreign apostle over the churches there in uh, Palawan came, and he wanted us to stay in Palawan and keep building up his work. So he, he was one of the ten spies, okay, that didn't have a good report. He said, you know, you shouldn't go to Manila. That's untried, unproven. You've never done something like that. You don't know anyone in Manila. And then he gave the real word of faith. He said, you'll probably backslide if you go to Manila. Okay. Well, we know people now. And I don't think we backslid. That man has had a rocky road. But if we go forward in faith, God will be with us. 20 years ago, we started the first Zion Ministries magazine, and I felt to publish 5,000 copies. And a missionary came to me and said, Norman, you don't know very many pastors in the Philippines. Why don't you, you know, make 100 or 200? And I reevaluated. No, I felt God wanted 5,000. Well, the last issues were printing 35,000 in the Philippines, and we just printed another 6,000 copies this month over in two languages, over in Myanmar and in other nations of the world. Don't listen to everybody. Listen to God. Amen. Amen. Now, along with that, let me say, but listen to your church leaders. Listen to wise counselors. 
Don't just decide you're going to be, you know, the lone ranger that goes off on his own personal crusade and is never seen again, okay? No, of course, we need wisdom. But if you've heard from God, if it's been confirmed, if it's the right time and the right way, don't listen to the discouragers. They want to hold back the people of God from arising and doing exploits for God, seeing the hand of God doing miracles to bring his people forward into restoration, into arising in strength, into making an impact upon cities, provinces, and nations. The provinces around didn't want Judah to succeed. And they spoke words of unbelief. But Nehemiah would counter it with, but God will do it. Now, after that, when they saw that the words was not in, were not enough to just discourage and, and uh, defeat the people of God, then they upped the pressure and they decided to attack. So let's read from verse 6 through verse 8 of Nehemiah 6. So we built the wall. The entire wall was joined together up to the half, uh, up to its half, for the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, and they became, became very angry, and all of them conspired together to, to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. And so... Very soon they were being successful. They had rebuilt the wall half of its height. And when the enemies around heard that, then instead of laughing at their efforts, they started to get nervous and said, uh-oh, maybe, maybe they will rebuild. And so they came up with a new plan that they were going to gather together and go and fight. And so it was not just Sanballat, the governor of the province to the north. It was not just Tobiah, the governor of the province to the east. Now there was also the Arabs to the south and the Ammonites to the west. Now the enemy had made a confederacy to the north, south, east, and west. Judah was surrounded by enemies that said they were going to attack. And things looked very difficult because the Jews didn't have an army. And all of these other provinces around were much stronger than them. Many times, Satan will attack a people of God that are going forward. Now, before Nehemiah was rebuilding, they didn't worry about the Jews. They didn't worry about them when they were a weak, defenseless province. And if the Christians are discouraged and weak and aren't accomplishing anything, the enemy isn't afraid of us. He doesn't mind lukewarm Christians that are just uh, hanging on until Jesus comes. But if Christians get a vision of arising to build, to fight, to go forward in the name of the Lord, then we become a threat to the dominion of Satan. And when we become a threat, that is when he will fight back. So a lot of times people come to me and say, Brother Norman, oh, there's so many attacks against me. And there are basically two reasons why we get attacked by Satan. Either, number one, we have sinned and we're an open target for the enemy, or we're going forward with God and he's afraid of us, so he's trying to stop us. You find that when David was anointed as king in 2 Samuel 5, the first thing that happened in the next chapter is the Philistines went to war to try to stop the new king before he could get strong. Whenever we go to a new anointing, to a new step forward in God, if we're a threat to the enemy, he will fight against us. So whenever we're attacked and we've got great problems, we just need to evaluate. Lord, is it because of my sin and my failures? Or Lord, is it because we're going forward and the enemy is afraid that the Christians are going to break down his territory, steal? And so... If you find yourself facing a lot of attacks and it's because you are having a fresh dedication to God, you have decided to face the problems and fight them, then that is a good thing. 
I wish you many troubles, okay? <laughs> I wish you many battles. <laughs> if the reason is because we are going forward and the enemy is counterattacking as he retreats, okay? Just a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity and we felt it was the Lord that we should expand the land here at ZMI and purchase the property just to the south of us on the road going in, the vacant land there. And so uh, we, uh, my wife and I walked through the land one day praying and saying, yes, this is of God. Well, that night we were attacked by the various spirits that inhabit the area down there. They didn't bother us when we didn't bother them. But in the name of Jesus, your time is short. Okay? <laughs> and so there will be battles. And we need to be ready to face them in the name of the Lord. Amen. With lives that are ready, but with hearts that are set to go forward in God. And so... We read that when there was this danger of the enemy going in and attacking, let's read what Nehemiah did in verses 13 through 15 to protect the Jews and, and their rebuilding. <coughs> Nehemiah 4, 13 through 15. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall in the opening, and I, and I set the pe people according to their families with their their spear and their bows, bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing. And all of us returned to, to the wall, everyone to his work. When the enemy heard that we knew they were going to attack, we were ready to fight back. Then they said, oh, our secret plot is no longer a secret. We cannot go and give them a surprise attack. Now, logistically, or according to the kingdom of that day, the provinces of Samaria and of the Ammonites and the Arabs to the south, they were all different provinces of the same empire, the Persian Empire. And, you know, provinces in an empire aren't to fight each other. Just like, you know, uh, Bula Khan isn't supposed to go, you know, fight Cagayan, and, you know, Isabella shouldn't join in and fight another province. No, they're supposed to all work together. And yet, because they didn't want the Jews to arise to strength, they were ready to try a surprise attack so that with a surprise they could inflict a quick defeat and then retreat before, maybe in the middle of the night before they even knew what happened. And it would not be an open warfare. They couldn't succeed in open warfare, but they tried a secret quick attack. And yet, when Nehemiah was ready to stand against them, they couldn't do it. And there are a lot of times if we will stand our ground, then the lies of the enemy, the schemes of the enemy are stopped right there. The enemy boasts and says, oh, we're going to destroy you. And if we say, in the name of Jesus, no, you are not. Then they go, Sihon, okay? They don't believe us. And they're defenseless. They're powerless. Their power often resides not in their ability to do something, but in their ability to make us afraid and weaken the people of God. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be safe. And so we are not to fear man. We are to fear God. But when we're going forward in God, we are causing trouble to the enemy. We cause trouble to the complacent. We cause trouble to, uh, to lukewarm Christians that don't want to be confronted 
with the rebuilding the gates. They don't want the old gates, the old standards of righteousness. They don't want to rebuild the dung gate and take the garbage out of their lives. They, they, they don't want to be inconvenienced with these things. And when we're going forward, people will oppose. They might threaten your life, like Nehemiah and the builders were threatened. But more often, they're more subtle and more polite. They'll say, Pastor, I heard a rumor that if you keep doing that thing, there's going to be five families in the church that are going to stop paying their tithes. And you're going to add more water to your breakfast and less chicken, okay? <laughs> or they'll say, oh, pastor, you shouldn't do that. You know, you're going to get people angry at you and, and they're going to vote you out and, and you, you shouldn't stir up trouble. No, don't touch that problem in the church. It's been there for years. It's not so bad. But if you want to rebuild, then sometimes you have to put your hand on troubles that may have even been there for years. The walls of Jerusalem had been broken down for over a century. But Nehemiah was ready to face the problems and to do something about it. And there will be times people will threaten you with all kinds of things. And they'll say, oh, the Barangai, you know, captain is mad at you. He's my uncle. You don't, you don't touch this problem. Or at times, you will be threatened, even with your life, with a bolo. Or they'll say, we'll burn your church down if you do that. Occasionally, pastors are blessed with an envelope in the mail with a bullet inside. <laughs> okay? And those things aren't fun. But if we're going forward in God, we are going to face opposition in all kinds of various forms. And we need to be ready to be Nehemiahs that will be ready to face up against the opposition, the difficulties, the threats that are around us. Once on the island of Palawan, there was one of the churches uh, that we were uh, uh, members of the board over. And this church, the Muslim rebels had moved up from the south and ruled that part of the island. They had taken it over. The Philippine military had withdrawn up north. And we heard about the distress of Pastor Edwin, and not Edwin Abbasado, OK? <laughs> And uh, once when they held their <clears throat> church service and the people, the Christians, were walking on the pathway into the front door of the church, they had a semicircle of the Muslim rebels standing there with their guns in front of them surrounding the entrance to the church looking at the Christians coming to church. Now, if you had rebels standing there with their guns, would you walk down the pathway into the church? <laughs> Once there's a true story when Russia was communist that there was a secret meeting of Christians there. And all of a sudden, burst in through the door, through Russians, two Russian soldiers with guns, and said, all right, everyone, everybody that's a Christian, you, line up against the wall. And if there's anyone here that's a visitor, you're not a Christian, get out quick. We're going to shoot the Christians. And all of a sudden, some people scurried out the door, and they were gone. And, and the pastor stood up, stood against the wall. Other Christians stood up there. And after some had scurried out and were gone, and the rest were at the wall, then the two men took off their guns and their hats, and they said, good, praise the Lord. The hypocrites are all gone. Let's have church. OK? Now, that happened in Russia, but back uh, in Tina, Palawan, they didn't know what the Muslim rebels were going to do looking at the Christians coming in. And so it was a very discouraging time for the church. And I prayed and said, Lord, what can we do to strengthen the Christians there in the little barrio of Tina? And God put it in my heart to go visit them and hold a prayer meeting for them and to encourage them that, yes, there were rebels in their midst, but stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So I convinced uh, two pastors to come with me, and we drove down from uh, 
Kizone, and uh, it was, the road went through the jungle. It was just two muddy dirt tracks. Uh, but we went down past a military checkpoint, a second one, and then another one. And then there was nobody, and it was silent in the jungle. And we knew we had passed from government control into the area controlled by the rebels. Finally, we got through the jungle and went to the clearing to the town and met Pastor Edwin. And I greeted him and he said, Brother Norman, what are you doing here? The rebels are all around. They're, they're watching you right now. And I said, Brother Edwin, we have come here to tell you that you are here from God. And the Christians here are to be strong in the Lord. Stand against fear and be strong in the Lord. And then we had a prayer meeting, and then we scooted out before night time came. <laughs> okay. But there are times that if we stand against the darkness, that will make them run instead of us. There is a time when... I went down to Rojas City and was holding a pastor's seminar and prophesied over one brother and said, the Lord sees that you are like Gideon hiding in the wine press from the enemy. But just as the angel of the Lord spoke to him while he was hiding, the Lord says to you, you mighty man of valor, you are going to beat back the Midianites. And I turned to the, uh, to the pastor. We were holding you know, the seminar in his place, Ray Calusa, and I said, brother Ray, you know, is that a pastor? Is he facing danger? And he said, oh, he's the district presbyter of the Assemblies of God here in the province. He just got a death threat about three days ago from the NPA. And he's wondering about running away and hiding or staying. So yes, that prophecy was very welcome. He decided to stay. And it wasn't the Christians that ran away. It was the NPA. If we will stand strong in the Lord... If we will not fear the enemy, the Bible says in Proverbs 28.1, the wicked flee when no one is chasing them, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Amen? Amen. And if we're righteous, we don't run away. We let the enemy run away. Now, that doesn't mean you're, you do dumb things, you know, without the direction of God. I'm not telling you all to go to Mecca and preach that Muhammad is a false prophet. <laughs> Okay, we use wisdom, yes, but when you are defending your people, when you are defending your family or your church, those around you, you don't have to wait for 17 visions and 15 prophecies. If you are defending what God has given you, fight. Amen. Nehemiah said in verse 14, he said, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome and Fight! Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. And he stirred the people up to stand against the darkness. We should not fear the enemy. He should fear us. Once I was traveling alone in a uh, isolated area of Palawan and Darkness overtook me. I couldn't get it. I was at the end of the, uh, the boat trip, but there were no jeepneys uh, going anywhere from, from Quezon, from the end of the road. So I had to stay in. Uh, there were no cement room hotels back then, 30 years ago. Uh, just Sawali, uh, little uh, houses there. And there was a restaurant that had a couple of rooms for rent. And it was a bamboo slat floor, Sawali walls. And then I looked at the door. It was Sawali. Then I looked at the doorknob. The doorknob was just uh, a little piece of wood nailed with one nail on the side. And then, you know, the door opens, and then you turn the wood, and the door is closed. Okay? That was my lock and my latchet and, you know, everything for the night. And back then, you know, Quezon was, a, was kind of like the Wild West. It wasn't uh, as, uh, as good as today. And as I was, was eating my sand there, part of our barcada that uh, came up to me and sat down and tried to be friendly and talk to me. And then he popped the question. I knew this was why he had come over when he said, he said, you know, this can be a dangerous place. Do you have a gun? And I knew that, well, I was sleeping at night. Anybody could just take a knife 
and just knock, knock up the wood, open the door silently, and there I would be, snoring, which is what I do, okay? And I turned to that man, and I smiled at him, and I said, I am well protected. <laughs> and he went away hurriedly and talked back to the guys. Oh, 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 oh. I slept very good that night. Never woke up once, okay? Because the righteous are bold as a lion. It's the wicked that flee. If we will stand up in God, he is our shield and defender. And so Nehemiah stood up and said, no, we're not going to back down. We're going to get ready to fight. Now, the enemies, although their armies were much stronger, they could not openly fight against Nehemiah because it was, as I said, a province of the same empire. And they had heard that Nehemiah was a favorite of the king. So if they were in open war and killed the king's cupbearer, <laughs> you know, the king would have sent soldiers to their provinces and ay ay ay. So they could do secret, you know, and, 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 and uh, things and, and so fear, but the enemy didn't have the power to conquer a man of integrity and strength. And that's what we need to be. If we want to be Nehemiahs, rebuilding a triumphant church, victorious families, people turned around from failure and discouragement and sin into the victory and the joy and the righteousness of God's kingdom. Now, as they were ready to fight and the enemy kind of like faded away, seeing that they really couldn't accomplish anything, then let's read in verse 16 and 17, what Nehemiah instituted from then on. So it was from that time on, the half of the servant worked at construction while the others, other half held the spears, the shield, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with one other held a weapon. Okay. So from that time on, as they kept building, with one hand, they held a building tool, a, a building tool, maybe a trowel if they used mud uh, or cement in, in making the wall strong. And with the other hand, they held a weapon. They built and they were ready to fight. And if we're going to be Nehemiahs rebuilding the gates, rebuilding the walls, making a people of God strong, we have to be building and ready to fight at the same time. Ready to fight. Now, nobody likes to fight. It's difficult. It's dangerous. There is never a convenient time to fight. It's always inconvenient and it's always dangerous. But Nehemiah and his and his uh, workers were ready. They determined that they were going to face anything that would come and be ready. And we need to be ready to be building for God and guarding and ready to fight at the same time. Sometimes when people build and they're successful, they say, oh, I'm successful. Oh, the church is big. The tithes are good. Oh, it's time to relax and enjoy the goodness of God and, you know, go on a vacation from God. Stop praying and reading, my, you know, just, just enjoy God's goodness. But they were building and ready to fight. Building and ready to fight. Building and ready to fight. There's the story of one very successful king in the Bible. Every battle he fought against the enemy soldiers, he always won. It was the battle he didn't try to fight that he lost. Let's read about this in 2 Samuel 11, starting in verse 1. And it happened in the spring of the year, at the time where kings go out to, to battle, that David sent out Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Okay. But it was the time when the kings went out to war, but... 
David sent out his army commander and his army, and he stayed home at the palace. But the scripture just said it was the time of year when the kings were to go out to war. And David, successful and prosperous, said, well, I don't have to go out. I'll just send my lieutenants. We're strong. They don't need me there. I'll just stay comfortable at home. Well, what happened is he was staying comfortable back in the palace. Let's keep reading. But David re remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the, the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David, David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Okay. And so David was staying at home. He wasn't worrying about the battle. He didn't really think he was needed. He was prosperous and successful. Well, let them fight. And he's staying home comfortable and just nothing to do, maybe being bored and restless, walking around his palace, you know, looking in everybody's windows. Well, what are the neighbors doing, you know? And, and then he, oh, Gandasha, okay? <laughs> And then he saw Bathsheba taking a bath up on the roof, and his palace was probably higher. So he saw the whole thing. But he should have been out at the time when the kings were to go to battle. Instead of fighting the battles of the Lord, he was comfortable and prosperous. And, you know, life was maybe getting very comfortable, but maybe a little boring. You know, nothing new I'm conquering today. Well... Oh, maybe I can conquer her, okay? <laughs> and he switched from fighting the battles of the Lord and having an exciting life serving God to looking for the excitement of the flesh and of wrong things in his life. And if we do not maintain a vigilance in our Christian life, if we are not ready to fight, if we grow comfortable and complacent. Life may get very comfortable, but it can also get boring. And nothing's happening, and you know, nothing exciting anymore. And, and when people, when Christians get bored of serving God, bored of praying another soul into the kingdom, bored of starting a new ministry, when they just sit back and relax and enjoy what they've got, then the temptations of the flesh can look much more appealing. The Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. But what if we say, oh, I've been anointed so many times. Oh, but, you know, I want to relax. I, I, I haven't prayed any, you know, this last week, but that's okay, you know. Well, if we're no longer filled with the Spirit, there is a natural substitute for that, and that's, being filled with wine. If we're not filled with the love of God anymore, we might substitute it for the love of other things. If we're not being excited with serving God and going forward in the spirit, then people might get excited with R-rated Hollywood movies or maybe with pornography. And we need to keep ourselves in readiness as soldiers of God so that we don't find our comfortable life slipping back into the things of sin that will imprison us and keep us from being effective soldiers and rebuilders of the kingdom of God. So we need to remember the admonition of 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Your enemy, like a lion, roaring lion, seeks to devour whom you are to resist steadfast in the faith. We need to remain strong against the enemy, strong against sin, strong against temptation, and not just get comfortable and say, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's vacation time from God, okay? No vacations from God. The enemy is always there watching for if you take a vacation. Okay, He knows when we're weak, and he's ready to attack if we are not ready to defend. And so Nehemiah was always there building and ready to fight, building and ready to fight. 
And so, when the enemy couldn't defeat them that way, in chapter 6, they came up with new tactics, new attempts. This time to personally trip up Nehemiah. So let's start reading in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 and on. Now it happened when Sambala, Tobiah, Jeshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though that that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sambalat and Jeshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of honor. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? while I leave it and go down to you. But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sambalat sent his servants to me as before, the fifth time, with one with an open letter in, in his hand. Okay, the first four times, Sambalat sent a sealed letter, an official government communication sealed by the governor of Samaria to the governor of Judah. And four times tried to get him to just stop working, just come down, have a meeting, you know, let's talk this through, let's, let's have a conference and, you know, let's work out our differences. Maybe being ready to kidnap him or kill him if he would leave Jerusalem because the place they wanted him to go, uh, oh no, was 40 kilometers uh, out of Jerusalem over near the borders of Samaria. And they wanted to get him near Samaria where... They could perhaps get a surprise attack, maybe kidnap them. So should he go to, oh no? What's the answer? Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, that was a trap of the enemy. And when the first four didn't work, then the fifth time, the governor sent an open letter, not sealed, open, anybody could read it. This was a public communication. And what did he say this time? In verse six. In it was written, it is reported among the nations and Jessam says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. Okay, that you are secretly planning to be their king, and you're going to rebel against the empire. That was the rumor that they started to spread. And that was a much more dangerous threat. If they were going to report to the Persian king, Nehemiah, the man you sent as governor, He's declaring himself to be a new king. He's getting ready to rebel. Oh, King Artaxerxes. But verse 8. Verse 8. Then I sent to him saying, No such thing as you say are being done, but you invented them in your own heart. For they were trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the, in the work, and it will not be done. Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Okay, so they were trying to weaken them, make them afraid, uh, get them to compromise, get them into, you know, a conference, and let's, let's you know, uh, let's make this a win-win situation for the Samaritans and the Jews, you know, because the Jews were winning, 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 and the Samaritans were losing, losing, losing. So they wanted to, you know, make a compromise and try to change things around. And whenever we're going forward for God and we are a threat to the enemy, Anytime we're making people uncomfortable, sometimes even Christians uncomfortable, if we need to shake them out of complacency, out of unrighteousness, out of wrong patterns in defeat. When we're going forward, many times our opponents want to set up a conference, set up a committee, and pressure us to compromise. Back 86 years ago, a crazy German dictator of the name of Adolf Hitler was expanding his army and the borders. They were swallowing up areas of the surrounding nations that were German-speaking, Austria and the uh, uh, Sudetenland. And then they were uh, planning to go in and take part of Czechoslovakia. And the, the prime minister of England and the president of France said, Hitler, if you invade one more country, we're going to declare war against you. And in 1938, their armies were much stronger. Germany was rising quick, but their armies were stronger. 
And so Hitler said, let's have a conference. And they had a conference in the city of Munich. And from that conference, the prime minister of England went back to England and he came off the plane all smiling with the great message, peace in our time. And the message he said was, well, Hitler promised us if we just give him one more nation to gobble up and conquer, then he'll stop. So although we said we wouldn't let him do it, he only wants, well, you know, it's, it's not a bad compromise. We have peace in our time. And Hitler was allowed to invade and take over Czechoslovakia. Well, a year and a half later, as Hitler was rapidly growing much stronger, then he invaded Poland, breaking all of his promises. And then the Allied nations saw there's no bargaining with the devil. And they had to declare war, but they were unprepared and they suffered great defeats in the first months and years of World War II. They weren't ready because they were complacent. They had just wanted to stay comfortable. Peace in our time. Just make a little compromise. And that's what the enemies will do. They'll convince you, well, you don't want to cause trouble in the church. If you really deal with this problem, you're going to stir up a hornet's nest. So let's just be quiet. You know, it's not so bad. You know, churches have tolerated this for, you know, maybe a century, like the broken walls of Jerusalem. But we don't want to tolerate wrong things and let them remain wrong. We want to be rebuilders that will confront what is wrong and fix what is wrong so the people of God can rise to new strength, to new righteousness, to new victories going forward in God. We don't just want peace and comfort when it means making compromises that will weaken us. The enemies will say, don't touch that problem. Don't, you know, worry about that. Don't, you know... Use the finances and let them be used wrong. Just don't confront the problem with the treasure, you know. Half of the church are her relatives. Don't touch the hornet's nest. But if we make a little compromise with the enemy, he'll want a bigger compromise, like Hitler, and a bigger compromise, and more and more and more. If we follow the path of compromise, we are on the losing side. If we are like Nehemiah's that decide no compromise, we will build in righteousness. We will build the dung gate. We will build the valley gate. We will rebuild the fish gate. We will go forward in the name of the Lord. Rebuild the horse gate. We will declare war. We're starting a, to a new pioneer outreach. We're going to do this and that by the leading of God then we will beat back the powers of the enemy. So we don't want to remain complacent. Nehemiah would have utterly failed, but he wasn't like that. And let's learn and receive from his life, from his godliness, from his convictions. So we'll want to be Nehemiah's and not like the prime minister of England. Peace in our time. We'll keep everybody kind of happy. And we don't want to fight. There is a time for war, the Bible says. And if it's time for war, we don't want to be compromising to try to keep peace. Now, after this also did not dissuade Nehemiah. He said, you're just making up these stories, saying I'm going to be king. Basically, what he was saying to Sam Ballad the governor north of him was, okay, go ahead, send your letter to the king. Tell the king that you're saying, I am a rebel. Go ahead, see if the king believes you. Nope. Did the governor of Samaria want to accuse Nehemiah, one who had always been fully faithful and was a favored one of the king? Did he want to accuse him to the king? Nope. When the intimidation didn't work, he shut up. God has not given us 
the spirit of fear, or that can be translated the spirit of intimidation, but the spirit of power and of love and of a disciplined mind, that we won't be afraid, that we won't worry, but that we'll go forward. If God is leading us, who can be against us when God is with his people? And so, when that didn't work, they tried plan E. Okay, they tried A, didn't work B, didn't work C, didn't work D. No, now they're up to about plan E. They're, you know, they're desperate. They've got to stop the Jews. They're rebuilding. They've already got half done, maybe two-thirds done. We've got to stop this quick. So in Nehemiah chapter 6, let's read the new battle plan of verse 10 through 13. After, afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Del Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will, I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but but that he pronounced his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sembalat had hired him. For okay, this so here he found out when he rejected going in to hide in the temple at night, it was forbidden for him. He was a governor, yes, but he wasn't a priest. He couldn't just go and get an apartment in the temple. That was against the laws of God. And yet this man prophesied to him and it's more clear in the Hebrew. It's, it's a poetic form that the Jews often used in prophecy. In the New King James, it just says, For they're coming to kill you. Indeed, they will come to kill you. Repeated, but it was in a poetic form. He was prophesying this. Thus says the Lord, says the Lord, says, you know. Uh, and Nehemiah realized it was a prophecy. The enemies are coming. They will attack you silently. You'll die. Go in the temples. Shut the doors. That is a strong place. But Nehemiah would not break the laws of God and defile the house of God by his staying there at night when he was not a priest. And after he decided not to compromise, try to protect himself unlawfully, then he perceived. It's like he woke up and said, God didn't send him with that prophecy. No. He was hired by Tobiah and Sanballat to try to get me to sin against God so that after I slept in the temple, then the priests would be gossiping and, and then they'd send the news out, oh, Nehemiah has broken the laws of God. He has polluted the sanctuary. He slept there at night. He's not a priest. And, and then they would be able to reproach him and say, Nehemiah, you are not righteous. And if... They could tell the people of God that Nehemiah was not righteous. Then they would weaken the people that were trusting in righteous Nehemiah. And so there are times that the enemy is looking for ways that he can attack us, ways he can make us uh, slip up, he can trip us up, he can uh, get us to say wrong things or do something, even something a little wrong that then we can be accused of. Once there was an evangelist that started a big outdoor crusade in the city. And the day after he started the crusade, he was on a, a public bus there in the city taking the bus. And he gave his money and the bus conductor gave him back his change. And he looked at the change. It was, it was too much change. And so he called the conductor back and said, uh, sir, please, here, no, this is wrong. Uh, please, take this money back. You gave me too much change. And the conductor said to him, you know, I was at your crusade last night. I gave you that extra money to see whether you would keep it or whether you would give it back. People are watching us, and sometimes we don't even know it. People are looking to trip us up. They're looking for something to accuse us of, to sidetrack us and get us discouraged, turned out of the way. People that don't want to fully follow God are uncomfortable with people that do want to fully follow God. 
your zeal, your righteousness, your stand for God will shake their complacency. And either they'll wake up and they'll serve God more effectively or they'll fight back, defend their comfort zone and maybe look for some way to accuse you. There are wicked... Now, have you ever heard the natural proverb, misery loves company? There are a lot of miserable sinners out there that are convicted by your life. But if they can get you to compromise, if they can get you to sin, then you're not a conviction to them anymore. You're not a reproof. There are enemies looking at you. And we need to be careful that we stand for righteousness, that we don't get tripped up. Now, when Nehemiah saw that this was a plan to try to discredit him, to try to get him to break the laws of the temple and, 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 and sin, and then they could uh, tell all the people of God, don't follow Nehemiah, he's a sinner like everyone else, he's no good. He realized, though, that actually this was a prophet that had been hired to speak this prophecy for a wrong reason. And you study the whole book of Nehemiah, he never had a true prophet of the Lord come and encourage him. But he had a lot of bad prophets. Let's read uh, the next verse, verse 14, as he's praying. My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat, according to this, their works and, and the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. Lord, remember the prophet that's Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. There were prophets prophesying in Judah, but they were all prophesying the wrong things. They were paid to try to trip Nehemiah up into sin, or others were probably prophesying, the time is not here for the temple to be rebuilt. The time is not yet. Do not follow Nehemiah. Thus says the Lord, relax and be comfortable. Enjoy your lukewarmness. And don't fight. Don't worry. Be happy. Okay? And what's Nehemiah say? Fight for your sons. Fight for your family. Fight for your churches. Fight for the backsliders. And the enemy is saying, oh, just relax. Life is good. And we have to make choices before God. Well, he didn't have any good prophets. He just had bad prophets. And scripturally, a lot of times for every good prophet, there will be a couple hundred bad ones. Okay? And you even look around us in the church world. For every good prophet or true prophecy you'll find maybe a hundred uh, flaky prophecies or, or false things that are being said that would distract or deflect the army of God from doing the work of God. There were all of the false prophets in King Ahab's time, hundreds of them saying, go up and fight against Ramoth Gilead. God will give you victory. And only one of them said, God is allowing a lying spirit to speak through those prophets because Ahab, you are a wicked man and God is going to let you follow their false prophecies. Go fight and you're going to die in the battle. Only one good prophet warning the king, but he listened to all of the prophets that tickled his ear and told him what he wanted to hear. Oh, you will attack and, and destroy the enemy. You'll have the power of, of the mighty ones like, you know, the horns of iron. The one false prophet used to show the power of King Ahab. There's a lot of foolish prophecies in the body of Christ. In Guatemala, Sister Monica's home country, I go there and I hear all the complaints of the pastors. Oh, we had this prophetess from America come and prophesy to the pastor of the biggest church. Thus says the Lord, you're going to be the next president of the country. And so he quits his ministry and runs for the presidency, can't even get on the ballot. Next election, can't even get on the ballot. Uh, he, he ruins his ministry, and he is a disaster in the political arena. All moved on by a false prophetess, or at least a lady that was flying too high 
and maybe not a false prophetess, but at that time speaking a foolish, unbalanced, wrong prophecy. Have you ever prophesied the true word of the Lord? Amen? Next question, you don't have to raise your hand. Have you ever prophesied something that later you figured out was really just your own, your own foolishness, your own hopes and dreams, and it, it didn't work? You don't have to raise your hand, I can, but I'll raise mine, okay? Yes, there are times that we are excited, we're exuberant. Sometimes we go beyond what God is saying. We want to be very careful of that, and I, I try to be very careful of that, but that is a danger zone for people in the prophetic. And it brought destruction to the churches in Guatemala, a reproach to the body of Christ. Pastor Danny from Indonesia just told me this story a few weeks ago. Uh, 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 the, the man he works for, uh, whose house we stay at, his younger brother uh, ran for to be the vice president of the nation in the last elections just, was it about three or four months ago? Just recently. And just before the elections at a Christmas party uh, attended by the president of the country and great dignitaries, a prophet from Singapore prophesied over him, uh, you are going to have miracles from God and God is going to give you, you know, a political power and next year will be the, the victory. That was the uh, vice presidential elections. He finished last among the vice presidential contendants. The prophecy didn't work. But it brought great reproach. If we speak prophecies that sound good, we like to get on the bank bag and woo woo, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what happens if they don't work? Do we reevaluate? Was it a true prophecy? Was it a false prophecy? Was it a foolish prophecy? And let's read in 2 Thessalonians 5, verse 20 through 22. The wisdom of the Apostle Paul warning us, don't reject prophecy, but be careful to judge it and keep it pure. We're close to the mic. First Thessalonians 5, 20 to uh, 22. Do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Do not despise prophecies, but test them. Keep the good and reject. Turn away from everything that even has an appearance of evil. If the body of Christ does not judge prophecy and reject the false and foolish, then we go around telling everyone, all the unbelievers and everybody, did you hear? There's going to be a typhoon. Uh, you know, there's going to be a tsunami in Manila Bay. You know, and the prophet said it will be tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Okay? And so quick, warn everybody to leave Tondo and, you know. And then what happens if it doesn't work? Then all of the unbelievers and even the evangelicals that aren't sure about the prophetic, they learn to despise prophecies. If we are accurate with the prophetic, the Christians, even the non-Pentecostals, will respect the voice of prophecy. But if we just let everything float around and yay, 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 and then, you know, two people and three people are all prophesied to be the next governor or the next president or something, you know, well, which prophecy do you believe, you know? And maybe none of them work. Nehemiah was not sidetracked. He was not deflected. He wasn't taken on a wrong path by false and foolish prophecies. Now, I doubt that very many of us here, you know, I doubt that very many prophets are going to come to Pastor Edmund and say, thus says the Lord, you're going to be, you know, uh, the next president or, you know, the mayor of uh, Mandaluyang. I don't, I don't have, have you gotten very many prophecies like that? Not very many, right? Okay. No, but there are other more subtle ways that people give us false prophecies. People tell us, oh, there's a revelation. There's a revelation, but it's secret only if you are being told. There is a new a way that's been found. There was a godly man that had a revelation, and he knows a business that if you join in with us, you're going to be a millionaire within six months. Join our company. 
And all of a sudden, Ooh, I like that prophecy, a millionaire in six months. Okay. One of our graduates told us of a pastor that went to Malaysia to a, a prophet's church where they were given revelations. And he came back and said, in two weeks, I learned more than I had learned 30 years as a Christian. <laughs> 30 years growing in God. In two weeks, at a prophet's seminar, you learn more than in 30 years. Either you didn't learn much of anything or, you know. And then he got back to his church. And the first service, he called for an altar call to give his new revelation. And he told everyone, I'm asking you, at the count of three, to run up to the altar and imagine there's gold everywhere. Run up here, be the first, and grab all the gold you can get. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on, are you ready? Come on. Okay, imagine, there's gold everywhere. Oh, have you got the vision? And then he called for the altar call, for people to run down and grab their goal. He learned that at the prophetic seminar. Imagine your goals and you're getting it. Well, a few weeks later, he quit his ministry. He moved to Indonesia, where he panned for gold out of a riverbed. Lost his ministry, left his family. And that's the last I heard about that pastor. There are false prophecies, wrong doctrines, as Pastor Edwin said last night, that can impart a spirit of greed or a spirit of, what did he say? Covetousness, where we're coveting. Oh, there's millions to be made. And sometimes it takes the form of false, uh, you know, uh, super healing medicines. By our super solution, it comes from the holy land, okay? Uh, or, you know, oh, we had a revelation and we went and we dug in the deep and there in the cave we found this special thing. And if you take this, you know, you'll be healed of all kinds of things. It's a revelation of God. They're giving it as a prophecy. This Sell this, and you'll become rich, and all the people will be healed. In another Asian nation, the leading newspaper of the nation did a great work of evaluating all of the miracle cures being sold in their nation. A big nation, over 200 million people. And there were uh, hundreds of quack medicines and miracle cures and, and herbal medicines and, and miracle things being sold. And they analyzed them all chemically and found that more than 60%, almost two-thirds of them, had powerful combinations of steroids put in that medicine. And a steroid, if you don't know anything about it, it gives you temporary good health, appetite, gets rid of arthritis, uh, put on weight, strong muscles, you'll look healthy, you'll feel, for a short season. But after a few years, or if you take too much, you can have heart attacks, strokes. You can have uh, all kinds of sicknesses that come upon you from, from uh, this fake medicine that doctors don't prescribe to people and just tell them, take all you want. And there are a lot of people that will say, this is from God. And it's actually from the devil. Someone has put in a wrong drug to temporarily make you feel good, but it's going to steal years off of your life. And if you say, but I feel good, so I'm going to sell this to others. They might feel good for a few years. But then you're stealing their years of health to get some of their money. How many of you are chemists that can evaluate the quality of your health products? <laughs> unless you know the quality of your health products, unless they come from a reputable, maybe a herbal chain in America that's quality controlled and FDA approved and you know something that's got uh, uh, credentials, not just I had a revelation or we found it in the Holy Land or something, okay? Not just some kind of weird prophecy or false promise, okay? Unless you know it's safe, you might be selling poison and making a profit off of other people's future sickness. And so we have to be careful as pastors, as leaders, 
People are looking to give us false direction, false directions, either to turn us aside or to let greed uh, take us away or fear or, or just wrong directions in our life in ministry. And we need to be those that face in the direction of what God is saying to us, that are following what God is doing to rebuild his church in these last days, that we stand for righteousness, we build godly families and churches, and that we don't just wait for some super-duper new revelation that this new uh, church evangelism technique, your church will double in three weeks. Okay? There's all kinds of foolish prophecies and wrong things deflecting the people of God from the pathway God wants. Now, we want to be open to God showing us new things, but Nehemiah didn't have any good prophets. And because of his integrity, Nehemiah actually didn't need a prophet. He had an integrity that God guided him according to the cleanness of his heart. Now, we do thank God for good prophecies and for true prophets. We value those. We want more of them. But we need to be aware that there are many different tactics that the world and the flesh and the devil can use to try to sidetrack us or trip us up or uh, get us to fall or, or be a reproach where we can be accused, where we've done something wrong, where there's a mistake and people can laugh at the church or laugh at your ministry. We don't need to give the enemy ammunition. We can live righteous lives, build righteous churches by God's grace. And that's what we want to learn from the lessons that we're studying these days. Learn about the different gates we need to rebuild. Tonight we're going to study about rebuilding the spiritual walls. We want to learn these things and gain the heart of a Nehemiah that will go forward for God. Forward, not counting the cost, but not going forward foolishly. Wise planning, consulting, building a team, going forward collectively, and doing great things for God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and let's close in prayer. We'll have our hour break for supper, but meditate during break time or tonight when you're back at home. Meditate on all of the things that are being spoken and see if any of these are dangerous for you. Are there areas where you're being pushed to compromise? Are there areas where you're being given a wrong vision to try to get rich quick or have, you know, a super secret uh, new church multiplication technique? Uh, things that sound good, but are they really from God? Are they a straight path forward? Or will they turn us aside to foolishness and failure? Let's ask God to show us these things, that we will grow up, that we will put away foolish things from among us, that God will help us to be a wise people of God, standing for righteousness, building step by step victorious, mighty churches in God. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Nehemiah's example. We thank you for a life, Lord, that was without compromise. A life of kindness, yes. A life that was sensitive to uh, Christians around, and yet a life that was not ready to compromise. A life that was not ready to back down. A life that was not ready to grow weak and discouraged. But Lord, even as Nehemiah prayed again and again, Lord, strengthen my hands. Lord, strengthen us. Lord, don't listen to them. Lord, give us new strength. Lord, we do pray that you'll give each one of us new strength. That, Lord, as you remind us of the weaknesses in our lives, of the weaknesses in our families, in our churches, in our communities, Lord, that we will cry out for grace and say, Lord, give us strength to build. Give us wisdom, Lord God. 
Let us declare war against the enemy. Though he fight, yet we are on the winning side. And Lord, we pray that you will raise up a company of Nehemiahs, a mighty army of men and women of faith and integrity, Lord Jesus, that will go forward to rebuild the walls, the gates, rebuild the families, rebuild the churches, rebuild a triumphant church that will conquer the gates of hell in these last days. Do it for us, we pray, for your kingdom and honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray.